Good afternoon and welcome to another installment in the guidance for parks as an essential service during a pandemic series. Um, my name is Dr. Razani and I direct the Center for Nature and Health at UCSF in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. I'd like to welcome especially our live audience, um, including colleagues at parks throughout the Bay Area, um, land managers, nonprofits working in the outdoors, um, and even people from uh, several uh, other states other than California. I'm absolutely thrilled that you can join us. We have almost 200 participants now, um, and we expect around 600. Uh, thank you to our partnering agencies um, that helped inspire and create this uh, lecture series, um, which include the Association of Bay Area Health Officers, East Bay Regional Park District, San Francisco Park and Rec, Marin County Park and Rec, Santa Clara Park and Rec, San Mateo, Sonoma County Regional Parks, Together Bay Area, and Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative. Um, a few quick ground rules for the audience. Um, to see the uh, presenter slides as best as you can, expand your Zoom window to full screen mode. Um, we have been soliciting your questions and thank you each um, for having filled out our, our survey. Um, but in addition to the pre-submitted questions, we will be taking questions live. Um, we will not be able to respond to the raised hand function, so please enter your questions um, into the Q&A function. Um, the previous um, video has been posted on YouTube, and this session will also be posted on YouTube um, in the upcoming days. I wanted to po post a few resources um, that were mentioned at the last lecture by Dr. Chan. One was the regional consensus statement, on outdoor recreation. Um, one was the CDC guideline on parks during COVID. And then finally, here's a link to last week's lecture um, on how parks can help flatten the curve. So with that, today we have uh, three lectures. The first is by Dr. Lynn Ramirez, who will give us an update on the epidemiology and transmission of COVID-19. That will take us till about 2.20 when we'll be joined by Dr. Sohail Sood, who will present a more detailed look at how COVID-19 is transmitted and the different forms of protective gear, um, primarily used in a hospital setting. At 2.40, we will be joined by Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna, um, Deputy Health Officer for Contra Costa County, who will help contextualize what we learned from the previous two speakers um, into local, policy and also a little bit about um, what you may be experiencing in parks. Um, the final 45 minutes will be a question and answer period with Dr. Erica Pan, who's um, Alameda County Health Officer and an infectious diseases specialist, Peter Chin Hong. So um, as we see unprecedented numbers of people going to parks, um, a partnership between public health and parks has never been more important. Um, I've been humbled to hear the ways in which you are dramatically changing your workflows and your entire profession in order to work to reduce disease transmission. Um, we hope that this uh, lecture series is the beginning of a dialogue and a source of empowerment for you. Um, and we hope to give you access to the most up-to-date information. These lectures are not in any way meant to replace local policy um, or to approximate the really hard decisions that you're making out in the field. Um, but we hope that they, they give you more information with which to make those decisions. So with that, let's move to our first speaker. Um, Dr. Lynn Ramirez um, is a professor of pediatrics and infectious disease. In addition to taking care of patients as an infectious disease specialist, Dr. Ramirez is the Medical Director of Hospital Epidemiology and Infection Prevention at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in San Francisco. And in this role, she's responsible for developing strategies that prevent the spread of COVID in the hospital setting 
as well as developing protocols that enable safe care for patients and for healthcare providers in the healthcare setting. Um, Dr. Ramirez, thank you so much for taking time from patient care and hospital care um, to prepare and deliver this presentation for us. We are absolutely grateful. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Yeah. And so uh, Dr. Ramirez is going to be speaking about the epidemiology and transmission of COVID. Great, thank you again. Um, I'm going to uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so the things that I want um, uh, people listening in to take away is that the number of cases continue to increase, including in California and the Bay Area, um, that, um, we go. Um, that um, while the transmission is um, primarily via the droplet route, there is a potential for contact um, transmission um, uh, playing a role in this pandemic. And that the approach to um, COVID-19 mitigation is really um, uh, multidisciplinary, multifaceted, um, and that um, you know, thinking about all the different steps that need to be taken um, will be really important in, in mitigating um, further spread of this infection. So just some, some basics around coronavirus. Um, it's a RNA virus and it's named after its um, crown-like um, uh, surface proteins um, as shown um, up here on the right. Um, it's an interesting virus in that it's able to infect a number of different animal species and also is known for the fact that um, there's a number of community uh, coronavirus strains um, that are actually pretty common um, uh, and are associated with pretty mild respiratory symptoms. That being said, um, we have experience in the past with um, pathogens such as SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV um, that are two viruses that can cause severe disease and forecasted the, uh, the pathogenic potential of coronaviruses in general. The COVID-19 pandemic is caused by SARS-CoV-2 um, and uh, it's really eclipsed um, these two other pathogenic um, coronaviruses in its degree of spread. So I, I think last week you guys um, reviewed the number of cases, but um, they continue to increase um, uh, and reach pretty staggering numbers. So the estimate as of um, this morning is that there's 3.7 million cases worldwide with more than 260,000 deaths. Um, the US um, has the most number of cases um, in the world by several orders of magnitude, um, and it also has the highest number of deaths. Uh, within the US, um, the areas of highest transmission include the Northeast, um, uh, Louisiana area, the Upper Midwest, as well as the Navajo Nation um, are the hotspots. Um, moving on to um, the, um, the numbers in California, uh, that we have had nearly 60,000 cases and nearly 2,500 deaths in our state. The counties that are the highest number of cases are in um, Southern California, including LA, Riverside, and Orange County, as well as San Diego. Um, if you look at the number of the, sorry, age distribution of the cases, the majority of cases are being reported in the 18 to 49 year old um, age group. Next slide. So it's really important in thinking about these, um, these very high numbers and the limitations um, that, that comes with them. And in particular, um, how um, COVID cases are being di diagnosed and reported. So you could imagine that um, these case numbers are really anchored um, on how much COVID testing is being done. And to put it into perspective, although there are multiple efforts in California and specifically locally to increase testing capacity, um, using the CDPH data um, that's available, only about 2% of Californians have been tested for COVID. I could tell you compared to about a month ago, that's better than the 0.5%, um, but there's, a, there's a, a long way to go in terms of uh, providing wider testing. Um, early on in any pandemic, um, the bias is to diagnose the most severe cases and, the, and those that have a, um, a higher case fatality rate. And this figure to the right, um, this little uh, triangle, really nicely illustrates um, that these mo more severe cases actually, uh, essentially represent the tip of the iceberg um, of the cases. Um, and it would be really important to have expanded testing um, in order to diagnose the spectrum of COVID-19, including those with mild to moderate symptoms, which are thought to make up 80% of, uh, of COVID um, uh, infections. And um, it will enable us to get a better handle on, on the people who are presenting with minimal symptoms or who are um, asymptomatic, represented at the base of this pyramid. Next slide. 
Um, so some of the more commonly associated COVID-19 symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Um, uh, but as we learn more about COVID-19, the range of presentation continues um, to grow, including things like loss or um, decreased sense of smell um, or taste, gastrointestinal symptoms. The other two categories um, that, should, that should not be ignored include uh, patients who are in the pre-symptomatic period, which um, is a period where you can detect the virus um, in, that, uh, in that person, but that person does not have overt symptoms. Um, these people um, who are in the pre-symptomatic period are considered infectious. And in particular, the CDC defines this infection period um, for people with COVID as starting two days before symptom onset. There are some patients who have COVID um, who can remain asymptomatic during the course of the infection. And there are really um, a range of varying reports on how common this is, ranging from lower numbers in some cross-sectional um, surveys to uh, much higher numbers, including in some pediatric co cohorts, cruise ship um, situations, as well as long-term care facilities. So moving on to the next slide, I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about transmission of COVID-19. And this picture, I don't know how well it's projecting. Oh yeah, it's projecting pretty well. Um, as a reminder of um, how um, the importance of droplet generation and the transmission of, uh, of this infection. So next slide. So um, when you think about the tr transmission of infections, there, there are uh, different ways that, they, that an infection can spread. So I'll give you the example of, um, of three types of uh, spread mechanisms. The first being droplet mechanism um, shown here in orange. And it happens when a pathogen um, travels uh, within a large droplet um, that's generated in the setting of like sneezing or coughing. And these droplets, because they're pretty big, usually only travel uh, pretty short distances. Um, the next option is contact spread, um, which happens um, when a pathogen is spread by our hands or via fomites. And a fomite is an inanimate object that um, is contaminated with pathogens. Another option is airborne spread, and that happens when pathogens travel within these much smaller droplets that are um, sometimes generated in the setting of a, like a medical procedure. Um, and the thing that's um, particular about these smaller droplets is that um, they're infectious um, over a longer distance. Next slide. So from what we know, COVID-19 is primarily sp spread by the droplet route. Um, uh, and we also think that um, contact is a potential route of transmission. Um, in terms of what's known to date, there are also very certain, condi uh, certain conditions where um, an aerosol generating event um, can result in the spread of, of this virus. Um, and I should underscore that these aerosol generating events um, are largely um, in the hospital setting. Um, examples I can think of happening outside of the hospital setting include um, things like CPR, uh, for example, in the community. Um, next slide. my computer first. Here we go. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, the persistence of this, uh, of this virus on different uh, surfaces. So a laboratory-based study um, looked at um, the half-life of SARS-CoV-2 um, on different surfaces. And on, um, on the right, um, I gave the example of plastic. So SARS-CoV-2 can persist on plastic for um, with a half-life of about six hours. Um, in comparison, um, SARS-CoV-2 does not persist as long in aerosols, which are those smaller droplet nuclei that I, des that I described um, with a half-life of, of about an hour. Next slide. Um, the time course of viral shedding is also important in understanding the transmissibility of this, of this pathogen. Um, and um, um, it's important to, to describe what we know about, about um, this part of, um, of viral transmission. So this is a figure showing the viral load um, over time from the symptom onset on the, on the right-hand side of this figure. And it basically shows that at the time that someone is presenting with sim symptoms, you already have some degree and actually a pretty high degree of, of, of virus um, that you're shedding. Um, and that amount of virus that you're shedding, both in your throat and in your nose, goes down over time. Um, so what this shows is that um, um, that the that early in in, in symptoms, um, your uh, your viral shedding is high, um, and it really um, uh, raises the question of well, uh, if it's high at the time you're presenting with symptoms, um, it probably is is relatively high in the period leading up to that. 
Um, right, next slide. So although the highest burden um, of virus happens early on in the disease course, um, the virus can be detected using molecular mechanisms and other bodily fluids like sputum and stool. And the top figure shows the amount of virus, once again, over time in sputum and stool. And you could see that um, from the time of symptom onset, it, it basically decreases over time, uh, but can be persistent um, on the order of multiple weeks. But it's, it's really important in thinking about uh, viral shedding in the context of, um, uh, of understanding that viral shedding does not necessarily equate to shedding of live virus. And this distinction is important um, because um, having pieces of virus in your nose is different than actually having virus that is um, still alive um, and able to infect others. So the, the bottom figure um, on this, um, on this uh, slide uh, tries to speak to that. So um, although the experience base is small, um, I'm showing here the results from a, a small case series of nine patients that looked at how long you can culture the virus or actually grow in the lab setting. And what you can see is that the virus um, is only culturable um, in the throat for four days, um, eight days in the sputum, and that you actually can never uh, grow it in the stool. Next slide. Um, so there's actually much more to learn around the relative infectivity between these three different groups of COVID infected patients that I described, the asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic and symptomatic. Um, so there's uh, probably more to come on that front. So next slide. Um, I also included some information around the national recommendations for discontinuation of, of isolation um, for COVID positive people. And in particular, these are the recommendations that are put forth by the Centers for Disease Control or the CDC. And basically um, what this screenshot um, describes is that once, if you are um, diagnosed with COVID, um, that um, the recommendation for stopping to um, stopping the or um, being able to um, um, not quarantine or isolate in the household setting um, is mediated on a number of things that you have to have at least 10 days having passed from your symptom onset. You have to be in the last 72 hours um, fever free as well as have an improvement in your respiratory symptoms. Um, so it, um, this information gives you a sense around potentially how, how long someone may be infectious. Okay, and I wanted to, to um, close out and talk about the contagiousness, contagiousness of SARS-CoV-2. And in particular, um, um, one of the ways to understand that is um, by something called the r naught, um, which is, um, uh, is a measure of contagiousness contagiousness of the virus and is defined as the expected number of people that will be infected by one person, assuming that the population is completely susceptible. So, so, so for SARS-CoV-2, you can see that that R0 is between 2.2 to 3.6, um, which means that for every infected person, um, uh, assuming that everyone is susceptible to the infection, you're going to have two to three and a half more people who are infected. Um, in terms of how that relates to other viruses, um, you can see on the right-hand side that um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is more infectious than things like seasonal influenza, but, but much less infectious than um, pathogens like measles. Next slide. Um, but uh, although that, um, this information is concerning, it's really important for us to remember that, that we can have an impact uh, on, uh, on, on this, and, and in particular, um, that um, all the interventions that we are um, carrying forward as well as immunity you know, within the population um, uh, basically uh, allows us to decrease that, um, that R0, um, and that's defined as the effective reproductive number. And this effective reproductive number basically captures the average number of secondary cases that you would expect from one infected person um, with interventions in place. So um, some of the things that are very familiar to all of you um, um, and are uh, super important are things like social distancing, sheltering in place, um, good hand hygiene, having um, uh, people who have COVID or who are COVID exposed quarantine and self isolate, and then uh, pretty uh, um, aggressive contact tracing of, of cases. Um, so not all is lost. Um, and you know, I think this underscores the fact that with all these different measures in place, we can actually have a big impact um, on the uh, transmissibility of this infection. So next slide. In closing, um, conclusions include that the number of cases continue to increase. Um, 
and that while trans, uh, transmission is likely by, via the droplet route, um, the contact route also plays a role. And that you know there are many, many um, remaining questions with regards to this virus, but one of them is um, the relative infectivity of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic patients compared to those who have um, overt symptoms. And with that, um, thank you again for the opportunity um, to uh, present to this group. Dr. Ramirez, thank you so much. That was an unbelievably great overview. Um, and I really thank you. I know you have to go back to seeing patients. Um, and so we appreciate your presence today. Um, and if there are any outstanding questions, I will reach out to you in the future. Thank you. And I hope to see you outside in a park after all this. <laughs> um, so I, we just learned that coronavirus is passed mainly through the droplet route and contact. Um, and so in order to get more detail on that, um, including how to reduce the r naught by protecting oneself, um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Sohil Sud, who is an associate clinical professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine at UCSF. Um, Dr. Sud is author of an article called COVID-19 and Keeping Clean, a narrative review to ascertain the efficacy of personal protective equipment to safeguard, safeguard healthcare workers against SARS CoV-2, and that's going to be published in the Journal of Hospital Pediatrics. Um, he presented his work at a recent Grand Rounds, which was the first time I had seen a really evidence-based look at um, personal protective equipment, which is why I invited him here, and I'm really excited um, to have him teach us a little bit more about transmission and how to stay safe. Dr. Su, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Just give me a moment here to uh, start my slide presentation. All right, so I have uh, no relevant disclosures to share. Um, and like Dr. Rizani mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the, experience, the opinions I express uh, are, are essentially mine and not, re not necessarily representative of any institution or regular authority a regulator, uh, regulatory authority. Um, and I'll start just by saying that I empathize a lot with the anxiety out there around how we best protect ourselves in this time with this new pandemic going on. Uh, I felt the same about three or four months ago when noticing both in the hospitals that I work at as well as around the country, if not the world, just such degree of variation in terms of how even physicians were protecting themselves against the potential of this virus. There were some that were using fairly minimal equipment, and then there were others head to toe covered just to be safe. Um, and, and so, you know, about three, four months ago, when I started to notice this, uh, my coping mechanism in these situations is to turn to the literature. And I started to do a little bit of a deeper dive to really understand some of the evidence behind uh, these personal protective gears and equipment. Um, and so initially I started looking primarily in a hospital and healthcare setting. Um, I've tweaked that a little bit for the purposes of this audience in this presentation, and I'm, I'm happy to share what I have in the hopes that it equips you with knowledge about the evidence itself. I'll leave the policy recommendations piece a little bit to the uh, public health authorities and the health officers, who uh, I imagine will be addressing that in the Q&A part, part of this conversation. Um, over the course of my literature review, essentially I came across four general categories of evidence and information. And so just as background, you know, we've been through something not exactly like this, but similar to this, as Dr. Ramirez described, when the world went through the SARS epidemic caused by the virus SARS-CoV-1 uh, back in 2002 and 2003. And uh, a lot of the questions we're asking ourselves now around how do we protect ourselves were asked at that time as well, too. Um, there's limitations around that type of research. It's, it's all done in a retrospective manner, which basically means you ask people who were infected and who were not, what were you wearing? Were you wearing a mask? What type of mask were you wearing? How close were you to the patient? Were you wearing gloves? Were you wearing a gown? And you can see how sometimes in, in hindsight, some of that information can be limited by the potential for bias or just a poor recall of exactly what was happening at the time. Um, so that's one category of data that, that I'll describe. 
Another category is, is that there's um, other respiratory viruses that occur with enough frequency that we can actually plan for them and study them as they're happening in real time. And by that, I mean every year we're inflicted by influenza. Every year we're inflicted by RSV, which is a common respiratory virus that affects uh, primarily children as well too. Um, and, and so we've done some creative prospective studies to look at how protective gear may work in those situations against those types of viruses. And I think that they apply to this COVID-19 context to some degree. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, uh, there the two other categories of information that I used in, in amassing this, uh, this review uh, include laboratory studies in which we've done things in a lab and tweaked various variables to see how uh, the transmission of uh, of different viruses can be halted in different settings. And then finally, we're learning more and more, as Dr. Ramirez mentioned, about SARS-CoV-2, about how COVID-19 is spreading. So I'll share some information on that front as well too. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ramirez mentioned, uh, and I completely concur, that the two primary forms of transmission are the respiratory uh, tract and that, that process of basically uh, secretions from a patient's nose and mouth ending up directly on a susceptible individual or through the contact group, which uh, I'll divide into two categories, either being directly, directly interacting with somebody who may have this, uh, who's infected with SARS-CoV-2 or indirectly by interacting with something that's contaminated with the secretions of somebody who's been infected. Um, and we'll do a deep dive on each of those and, and learn both uh, a little bit more details about how it can be transmitted and how we can protect ourselves. So starting with the contact-based route, basically the question we have to ask ourselves is, can you get sick by touching something? And that has been asked uh, now for at least 40 years, if not beyond that. Um, this is a study done uh, in 1981 in the United States in which they took infants who had respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, and basically had them do what infants do, touch things, drool on things, move around and play on things. And then they took those infants out of the room and had volunteers go into that room and touch those same items that the infants touched and then touch their face. Uh, the research went so far as to, uh, to call those volunteers touchers. And that, you know, to quote the study itself too, it said that it, it instructed those touchers to touch those items and then gently rub the mucous membranes of their nose and eye. So essentially scratch your eyes, pick your nose after touching these types of items. And so they found that these touchers did in fact get infected. Uh, four of the 10, it was a small study, got infected around five or six days later. Uh, and most had symptoms, some kind of cough and cold symptoms. And so in terms of the plausibility of contact-based transmission through the indirect route, uh, yes, you know, you can get sick by touching a contaminated object. Uh, but there's a lot more nuance to that, and so let's, let's dive into that. It, basically, to, to get sick through a contact-based transmission, four steps need to, incur, need to occur. The first step is somebody who's infected needs to come into contact and basically either you know, uh, contaminate that object, touch their nose and then touch the object, sneeze on the object, cough on the object. Then the second step is the virus needs to survive on that object. Just as Dr. Ramirez mentioned, if, if it's a dead virus on an object, it's not going to infect you. The virus actually needs to be alive to pr propagate infection. The third step is, is then uh, you, if, if you're a susceptible individual, you need to come into contact with that object, which typically means you need to touch it. And then the fourth step is you need to touch some part of your body that is susceptible to inoculation and infection which in this case primarily means you need to touch your face, uh, the mucosal surfaces of your face, so your eyes and nose primarily, and to some extent your mouth as well too. Uh, and, and so uh, let's look at survival on objects. This is a study done after that original SARS epidemic. This was done in 2010, looking at coronavirus. Um, and, and the type of virus this particular study looked at was a virus called TGEV. It's in the coronavirus family. Uh, causes disease in pigs, not in humans. And they are uh, intentionally infected the gear that us as healthcare workers wear. Uh, so our gowns, our gloves, our scrubs, our um, and masks, and infected our swaths of those items with uh, TGEV. 
And then they looked and said, how long is this infection going to last uh, on these various clothing and, and gear items? And uh, what I've highlighted here is, is the scrub fabric, because I think that probably applies most to um, maybe the uniforms or the clothing that people are going to be wearing uh, in the parks. And, and what you'll notice is that after two hours, the amount of live virus decreased uh, to, a, to a substantial degree. So of 100% at start, two hours later, 5% of the virus was essentially surviving. Four hours later, less than 1%. So yes, virus can live and survive on clothing, but as time goes on, less and less survive. So with more time, less virus is there. That is uh, you know, a proxy for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, to my understanding, I don't believe that this particular strain has been tested on clothing, uh, but it's been tested on various materials. And this is uh, uh, the same paper Dr. Ramirez uh, referenced a little bit earlier. Um, and I think one of the takeaways here is that the virus tends to prefer, as a lot of viruses do, they, they tend to prefer harder surfaces. So stainless steel, hard plastic, that's where the virus tends to live longer than on, say, a porous material like cardboard. Um, uh, th this graph, to, to dive on deeper a little bit on stainless steel, for example, this graph is uh, measures half-life. And so a half-life of six hours for stainless steel basically means that six hours later, half of the original amount is left. Six hours after that, half of that amount is left. So every six hours, you're cutting the amount of live virus in half. Um, and then again, the object needs to transfer from that, uh, so the virus needs to transfer from that object onto your hand. And that has also actually been studied fairly directly. This is a study done in 2013, looking at a particular virus called MS2 bacteriophage. It's a, um, a virus that infects bacteria. And what they did, what these researchers did, is they took that virus and sprayed it on various materials. So they sprayed it on stainless steel, they sprayed it on dollar bills, they sprayed it on clothing made of both cotton and polyester. Um, and then they had volunteers touch those contaminated items. And what they were measuring is how much of the virus from that surface ends up on your fingertip after 10 seconds of contact. And uh, there are two broad takeaways on that front. The first is that uh, similar to the survival of viruses on non-porous surfaces being higher, uh, viruses on those surfaces also transfer to fingers uh, at a higher rate on those types of surfaces. So stainless steel, Plast, uh, hard plastics, uh, glass, those had higher rates of transfer than on porous surfaces, um, such as dollar bills, such as clothing. Um, and those amounts of transfer were very, very low. So if you're touching, let's say, a fully contaminated dollar bill uh, for 10 seconds, the amount of virus that transfers onto your fingertips is about 1%, if not less, than um, uh, of the original amount that, that was uh, on that type of uh, material. The other takeaway, um, and this applies more toward the non-porous, the harder surfaces, was that a virus would transfer more easily in higher humid, humidity settings. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, from the fingertips, it needs to get onto your face. Um, and uh, I think the original study that I referenced with RSV shows uh, the fact that that can happen. And once you touch your nose or touch your eyes, uh, things can spread and cause infection on that point. Uh, so I won't belabor that fact. So if this is the way that contact-based transmission occurs, then the question is, how do we protect ourselves from it? And uh, we can map protective mechanisms onto each of these phases of transmission. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to come into contact with less contaminated surfaces, right? And so if we're symptomatic at all, if there's any concern that you might have the condition itself, now is not the time to tough it out or to get out there in the community. Now is the time to stay home. Um, and there have been studies essentially looking at this as well too. This is a, a study done in the mid 80s in which they took uh, people, put them in a room, had them sleep in bunk beds in that room, had them play in that room. They put set up video games. This was the 80s, probably Atari, um, and uh, had some poker uh, cards out and, and some tables and just had people live there. Now, the caveat was that 
uh, they would vary the amount of sick and healthy people in that room. They would intentionally make people sick. They gave them a strain of virus called rhinovirus 16, which uh, causes a common cold, so cough and cold symptoms, um, and uh, waited until their symptoms were at peak and then put them in that room. And uh, I won't go through all the details of the study, but they were be able to basically create conditions such that the more exposure you had to sick people, the higher chance you had of getting sick. It's, it's really that straightforward and that direct. So conversely, the less time we spend around sick people, the, the, the less chances we are uh, to contracting the illness. Uh, that's more of a theoretical laboratory-based framework. Um, there's also been a, a study, this was published I think about a week ago um, out of China that looked at COVID-19 and how that spreads. And so these researchers looked at uh, 1,300 people, roughly, who came into contact with 400 people who had laboratory confirmed COVID-19. And they found that the odds of contracting the disease increased approximately to six or seven to one if the contacts lived with the infected people, ate with the infected people, or traveled together. So the more time in more intense settings you spend with people who are infected, the higher the chances are of spread. So we have to really reduce that. But uh, as Dr. Ramirez also pointed out, there is a fair amount or the potential for people to not know that they have symptoms. So we can't say that staying home if you're sick is going to completely solve everything. There will be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people who are still in the community um, and they will you know, do what, what everybody does, touch various items as they go about their day. So to prevent survival on an object, uh, the best way to protect ourselves on that front is to clean surfaces. Um, and I won't go too deep into this uh, because I believe there may be some questions and, and the public health officers may be addressing uh, how to best clean and disinfect facilities. Um, but I will just point out that the CDC has a very helpful uh, detailed guidance on this particular issue. And then to prevent live virus from getting onto our body, the best way to protect ourselves on that front is really to minimize touch. Um, and, and that's where the parks, frankly, and being outside is, is such a great benefit on that front too. Um, you know, in terms relative to other spaces that we live and reside in, there's minimal surfaces that we come into contact with, uh, with other people. And to keep, uh, and then the other thing that we need to do is we need to keep our bodies and our hands clean. Um, and there's various ways to do that. There's cleaning our hands, uh, there's wearing gloves, and there's wearing gowns. Um, and I'll just say on the hand hygiene part that soap works. Um, it works really well in this particular virus uh, virus, which um, is called an enveloped virus. And in that sense, I think it's safe to think about it as having a thin layer around. Soap is a pin that just pops that balloon and then washes all those contents away. Uh, you know, spending those 20 seconds uh, singing your ABC songs, imagine that you are actually crushing the virus because physically speaking, that, 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 that's what you're doing as you're going about that process. Um, Alcohol-based hand gels also work very effectively. This was a study done uh, in 2017 um, in which researchers uh, took two formulations, and that's the black and the gray bars, of, what, of the recipes for hand gel that the World Health Organization has, has put forth. And they tested those hand gels against SARS-CoV-1, the, the uh, outbreak that was uh, present in the early 2000s. Um, and, and what that chart really shows is that you could water down those formulations as much as close to a third of their original concentration and still kill the virus. So it took less than a third of the, of the formulation for the virus to still survive. But beyond 30%, there was no viral, uh, live viral particles detected. So hand gels work, soap works. Um, and uh, with regard to evidence from the SARS-CoV-1 epidemic, um, there was a retrospective case control study, uh, or a number of retrospective case control studies that looked at healthcare workers and asked those healthcare workers, some who were infected, some who were not infected, how well did you participate in hygiene? Did you wash your hands more than 10 times a day? Did you wear gloves? Did you wear gowns? 
And if you did any of those things, all of them reduced your odds of coming of contracting SARS-CoV-1. Um, so hand washing works, gloves work, and gowns work. Um, I'll say, you know, personally, uh, because I know gowns may not be applicable to uh, the audience today. Um, when I'm in a healthcare setting, I was I was there yesterday. I wore a gown. I went seeing a couple patients. When I leave that room and I take off that gown, I still frankly imagine that that what I'm wearing is still potentially infected. There have been studies where they've, in a laboratory setting, used uh, fluorescent sprays, and uh, after people take off their gowns and gloves, they do find still using black lights that there is some degree a residual amount um, on your gloves or on your body and potentially on your hands. And that probably not has to do with the gowns and gloves not protecting you. It has to do with the way that you're taking things off and making sure that you're taking things off in a very safe and appropriate manner. So, you know, even if I'm wearing a gown or not wearing a gown, when I come home, I leave my jacket at the door, I wash my hands and I go upstairs and I change my clothes after work. Um, and so, and then the final piece, is, as we mentioned, is, is you have to try to avoid inoculating your face. Um, and, and I'll just acknowledge that that's hard. Uh, you know, this was a study done uh, in 2015 looking at medical students and had half the medical students uh, sit on one side of a lecture hall and they just told them, listen to this lecture, we're going to videotape you. And then they went through those videotapes and found that those med students in Australia touched their face 23 times an hour on average. I um, mean, half of those touches went to their nose or their mouth um, or their eyes. So, so it's, it's very hard. Um, and, and sometimes I get questions about why the eyes matter. And uh, essentially, there, there can be a number of different reasons for that. But one of them is that when you, uh, is that your eyes and your nose are connected. Um, that's why you sniffle when you cry. There's a duct between the two that allows tears to, to travel through. So that's how contact transmission works. Another potential way we can avoid touching our faces by wearing masks. No study to my knowledge has particularly looked at how well masks prevent us from touching our face, but you would think that one that is comfortable and well-fitting will prevent you from touching it. And perhaps one that's not comfortable or not well-fitting will make you touch your face more. So that's just one thing to keep in mind and be careful about. So that's it on contact transmission. Um, I'll also go through respiratory transmission, but try to do so a little bit faster as well too. Um, and to zoom in on that front, there's basically three ways that we can get exposed through respiratory transmission, or three steps in that process. The first step is secretions need to be expelled from that individual. The second step is they, those secretions need to survive in the air. And the final step is they need to land on our face and infect us that way. Uh, so if we look at secretions, um, as Dr. Ramirez showed, um, they can vary in terms of their degree of density and distance traveled by a number of factors. Um, and then in terms of survival of flight and air, that can also vary based on a number of different factors. And I would say, you know, if I personally had to share the air with anybody who was known to be infected, the outdoors is where I'd want to be. Um, the ability of great ventilation and the ability to dilute those air particles as widely as possible um, is such a boon and a benefit. So I, I completely agree with you know, other folks who've, who've mentioned that being outside is great on that front. Um, and uh, I will skip this, as Dr. Ramirez has mentioned as well too, that we do know that the virus can survive in the air. The only thing I'll mention is that this air was in a laboratory setting inside that machine on the right. Um, in patients, we've looked for live viral particles, and we haven't found them. We found particles, but so far in studies both in China and in Nebraska, um, none um, either haven't looked or haven't detected the presence of live viral particles in, in a small degree in the air. Um, and then sunlight is so tremendously helpful. It's hard to study actual uh, the, the, the effects of actual sunlight on viruses, but when we've taken that machine and uh, basically removed a door, and instead of the door, put a fake uh, sunlight lamp on that side, um, it's been able to reduce the half-life of influenza quite substantially. So from 30 minutes down to two minutes uh, with full sunlight intensity. Um, and then again, uh, the virus needs to land on your face to get infected. 
and they've tested that directly. They took some, some people who were infected and not infected, had them play poker with each other, and had the uninfected people not touch their face through these various contraptions and found that if you don't touch your face, you can still get infected. This is the restrained players um, who still got infected as, as much as half of them got, got infected. So how do we protect ourselves against respiratory transmission? Well, step one, again, if you feel like you've got symptoms, uh, stay at home. And step two is to wear masks. So we, we don't quite know very much in terms of the evidence of cloth masks and how well that they work. Uh, but, but it stands to make very frank common sense that if you're sneezing with a mask on, less of those particles are going to get out there. So, so the theory, I think, is very strong on that front. We have tested surgical masks, and those have worked very well. These are, this is a study done in 2013, where we took people who had the flu and had them breathe into that contraption and had them breathe for half an hour without a mask and cough, and then had them breathe for half an hour with a mask and cough. And when you're wearing a mask, the amount of aerosolized particles reduced tremendously in that process. Um, and then second, to protect ourselves from flight through the air, this is where physical distancing works. In that original study with RSV, they took individuals and then had a second group of people who just sat there six feet apart from the, from the baby and didn't wear a mask of any sort. They called these people sitters and none of them got infected. So when you maintain a safe distance away, it stands to, to show that the, the chances of get infect, getting infected significantly drop. Now, the, the exact amount of space to be apart, of course, is going to vary. If, uh, if you've ever seen you know, baseball players kind of argue with referees or, or umpires, you can, when they're shouting, particles spread closer, spread with greater intensity. And so, you know, it all depends on if, if uh, people are wearing masks or not, and uh, not just exactly six feet in every situation. And then to protect ourselves on the receiving end, this is another reason why masks can be helpful on that front. Uh, there's three types of masks out there. There's surgical masks, N95 respirators, and cloth masks. And this is how they're described from the CDC. A surgical mask uh, basically provides protection against the respiratory droplets. Uh, N95 respirators are, are not something you can really just buy on the shelf and put on your face. They require a, a fairly robust fit test, which I can describe if there's uh, questions about that at a later point in time. And then there's cloth masks. And again, the evidence on cloth masks varies quite a bit in terms of our ability to protect. But like the CDC says, the primary intention is to prevent the spread rather than to protect. Um, although it stands to, you know, to make some sense that they will help us in, in protecting us as well, too. Uh, so, so the question out there is, is are N95 masks, which are, you know, you know, really touted, I would say, in the media and in the press, are they the gold standard? Does everyone need to wear one? And uh, there's some studies and data to show that that may not necessarily need to be the case. This was looking at healthcare workers exposed to SARS-CoV-1. Uh, back in 2003, um, and uh, looked at 250 healthcare workers who were exposed to patients who had SARS. And of those 250, about 150 wore some kind of mask protection. Uh, and it didn't seem to matter whether you wore a surgical mask or an N95 mask, both seemed to protect you. So this was looking backwards. And then they've done two studies looking forward as well too. Uh, they, they gave nurses in Canada uh, for the duration of a full winter season, said you, every time you interact with a patient, you're going to wear a surgical mask. And a separate group of nurses, they said, every time you interact with a patient, you're going to wear an N95 respirator. And at the end of that winter season, it didn't seem to make a difference which mask you wore. The number of uh, infected nurses in, in both study arms was essentially the same. The same amount got the flu, the same amount got the common strains of coronavirus at the end of that season. Uh, you know, about 10 years later, that study was repeated with 10 times the amount of uh, participants in that study had the same outcome. It didn't seem to matter which mask you wore, both seemed to be protective. Uh, there may be some situations in really a healthcare setting where an N95 mask may be of some benefit, um, but, but 
you know, that's not necessarily always the case. And so I think with that, I'll conclude and just put up these two slides again, uh, just as a reminder, and then turn it back over to uh, Dr. Rosani. Thank you so much, Dr. Sood. That was fascinating. I, I really appreciate you sharing your experience. I know that a lot of what you spoke about is from studies of people that are known to be infectious or um, many of those studies were done indoors in lab um, situations. Um, and first of all, thank you so much and I hope you'll stick around for the answers, a uh, question and answer section. Um, but I have invited Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna, um, who is Deputy Health Officer of Contra Costa County, to kind of think through with us um, what the amazing presentations that we heard by Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Sud might mean um, from a policy level and also in parks. And while he does that, we're gonna set up for our, our very exciting panel and question and answer period. Um, so Dr. Radhakrishna, welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Ramirez and Sud for really helping us lead with facts as an antidote to fear. And we really empathize with the fear that's out there. We know as protests are increasing, uh, people are getting bullied and pushed, whether it's a McDonald's worker getting shot or a park ranger pushed into a lake in Texas. So there is real uh, fear and concern out there, and we're here to best educate the public and professionals to stay safe. Um, I think the science is helpful, but we also wanna stay humble that we're learning a lot about this virus and we'll continue to update people with the best science as we get it. Uh, even a call from this morning suggested that the state may look to consensus for isolation instead of 10 days to moving to 14 days. So things are very dynamic and we're here working closely with our academic scientists to give you the best information possible. I want to briefly outline some of the guideline documents that Dr. Chan mentioned last week uh, that's available on the YouTube link as well as what uh, Dr. Rasani shared. And then we'll move to Dr. Pond for more nuanced question and answers. So the seven health jurisdictions in the Bay Area are trying to be as lined as possible. Of course, at this point, we're recommending no destination recreation. Stay as close as possible to your home and enjoy the multitude of outdoor opportunities you have similar guidance. So limiting contact with high touch surfaces, thankfully, is easier outdoors than indoors. And uh, maintenance of bathroom and trash prevention uh, can be done per CDC guidance, uh, nothing specific for parks, although there is broader guidance for park administrators and staff. When it comes to appropriate personal protective equipment, there's this balance between what's needed in an intensive care unit and what can you buy at REI for recreational equipment uh, being outdoors? And we wanna aim for things that are evidence informed, but also reasonable and comfortable. So uh, as mentioned, disposable gloves, hand hygiene is important and washable reusable uh, gowns is adequate. They don't need to be the disposable healthcare type. And for low risk outdoor activities where you're not in close proximity for long durations with people would make cloth face covers sufficient, especially as we're facing shortages of the more formal N95 and surgical masks. And it's actually a requirement to have a certain supply, a 30 day supply for us to continue to open up society and the economy. We wanna be mindful of using the right gear in the right place. Um, that being said, we know that park staff do a variety of jobs. Some are indoors, some are educational, some are in closer contact, some are involved with children. And so you'll want to modify that based on your particular work duty, as we do understand it's very variable. But the basic advice for face coverings is to carry it with you and to put it on when you're within that six feet for transmission and to continue to follow the local guidelines as they will evolve over time. Um, if somebody has a particular health concern or medical condition or risk factor, they may want to have additional protection and that should certainly be allowed, um, but to set a reasonable bar for everyone to follow. So I'll end um, by guiding you to... Uh, I think... Um... Dr. Radhakrishna, we lost your audio. 
Oh. In okay. Uh, we've lost your audio, Dr. Radhakrishna, so um, I can help guide them through the next two slides. Unless okay. you oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, br briefly, the CDC does provide more guidance on disinfectants that are effective against COVID-19, uh, routine EPA-approved disinfectants that you can even make yourself if you run low on supplies. And the next slide gives additional guidance from the CDC on uh, in terms of how to access those supplies and again using appropriate PPE when using such chemicals to protect yourself and uh, Dr. Sood went into a lot more detail on the hand washing and the sanitizing. So I'll end just by uh, actually quoting Dr. Sood who said if I had to share the air with an infected person outside is where I would want to be. Um, we recently celebrated World Tuberculosis Day about a month and a half ago, and harking back to those times, it was a new pathogen, it was scary, we didn't have the ability to test for it, we didn't have cures or treatment for it, we've come a long ways, uh, but think back to the time of a sanatorium where outdoor air really minimized the risk, improved overall well-being. And if density and crowding is a risk factor, then being outdoors in less dense space with abundance of nature around us could actually be an antidote, not just for the social emotional well-being, but to decrease the indoor risk of being around others. So we wanna emphasize the practicality of as we move to the summertime, using face covers that are comfortable, breathable, well-fitting, uh, cotton, thinking about the hot summertime and something that where you won't be increasing risk by fidgeting and touching your face more often. Uh, and we'll move to more detailed questions from our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhakrishna. Your setting is quite soothing as well. Um, well, uh, thank you each. I, we just heard a lot of information. And at this point, I'm very excited um, to be able to ask some of the many questions that I've been receiving from you. Um, from our Alameda County Health Officer, Dr. Erica Pan, as well as an infectious diseases doctor, um, Dr. Chin Hong. And he focuses on um, patients who are immune suppressed. And he's currently involved in clinical trials to treat coronavirus and is an outspoken advocate for health equity in coronavirus response. Um, so welcome to both Dr. Pan and Dr. Chin Hong. Are you both here? Yes, definitely. Okay, Dr. Pan? Hi, welcome. So I have about 50 questions for you, <laughs> but what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, ask them, um, I've grouped them into categories and I've also looked up um, actually, I had help from Alice Kinner from East Bay Regional Parks to look up the CDC recommendations for the ones where I could find them. And so I will put those up while you respond to the questions. Um, the first category of questions was really, um, do people need to wear masks at all times in parks? So should I take that, Nushim? Yes, I will allow both of you to take that. And Dr. Pine, I just want to make sure we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Kim Hong, if you can give your perspective and then Dr. Pan can give the policy perspective. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nusheen, who would you like to start? I go can... ahead, you can go. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So no. I think from my perspective, I think it's a great question, which is when should you wear a mask? And I, for me, anyway, and, and what I tell community members, it's all about context. And particularly in the outdoors, it's not as bad. But if you can't control your environment, wearing a mask is a good idea. For example, early in the epidemic, I was seeing cashiers in Safeway, and they weren't wearing masks, and they couldn't control the environment because people were coming by them with a large number of shopping items. And that was very risky. But if you're in the outdoors and you can stay six feet away, it's not absolutely necessary at that point. So again, it's context specific. If you're in with a group, a tour of people who are coming into the park, in that case, because you're going to be at close proximity with people and there may be situations, 
if there's a narrow trail, for example, where you can't stay six feet apart in either direction from someone, wearing a mask in that situation is really good. So to, the bottom line is it's context specific. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Pan. Sure, and hi, I just have to briefly say it's so fun to see Peter because we were um, infectious disease fellows at the same time at UCSF. <laughs> um, I would agree with Peter and I would say from a policy perspective, this has been interesting because our first order and actually our current health officer order does say uh, sort of when um, exercising, including walking, hiking, running and cycling, that that's not required um, but you should carry one in case you're going to be around other people within six feet. I will say it's interesting from policy perspective as well that I feel a little bit like um, I've been thinking about whether we should change that to at least say when people are walking because I think they're in general, you know, and I, um, I didn't see all of the presentation, but it looked excellent. And I think in general, this idea of source control and from a public sort of community perspective, everybody needs to be participating in source control for it to sort of work effectively. And um, as we try to socially normalize this, I'm really thinking about, at least for walking and hiking, that maybe we should be, because people are having a hard time with the gray yeah. areas, I'd say, from a policy perspective. Um, but it'll be interesting to get this group feedback too. Uh, well, I have some of the gray areas and questions for you. So yeah. I do want to point out that the CDC has um, recommendations on their website. Um, and they, they do answer some of the questions that we receive, such as when, how often should we wash them? Do we need to sterilize them? And Dr. Sood talked about the importance of removing them carefully. Um, this, this is what I wanted to ask you guys, that which parks are grappling with. How should we, or should we even enforce wearing masks? I mean, I think that's, I love Erica's comment, Dr. Pan's comment, because again, if you look at some communities like in Hong Kong and Singapore, where masks are sort of like accepted and everyone wears it, it almost becomes easier than sort of like putting it on and taking it off. And it becomes part of, actually I wear a face mask all the time in the hospital because we have universal masking in the hospital. And it actually is quite comfortable after you start wearing it. It's different from an N95 mask, but a regular mask, it's comfortable and you get used to it. And I like the idea of normalizing it and maybe <clears throat> uh, the park service rangers and the staff by wearing it, you actually model behavior for people coming into the park. Great, Dr. Pan. Yeah, I think, um, you know, enforcement of course has been, um, I, I realize a challenge as well. And from a public health perspective, as I heard one of my colleagues mention recently, you know, we really, our health officer order is the strongest, you know, thing we can do and it is technically enforceable and, you know, technically people can be cited or fined, you know, with a misdemeanor. But of course, what we really want is people just to comply and we don't really, you know, we don't want people to get in trouble for this. We also want our community to come together to do this. And for the most part, I'd say the vast majority of people are doing that with all of our various recommendations, um, including face masks. But as far as enforcement, I think, um, I, I think where I've seen this, and again, uh, some of our parks people will be even more familiar with uh, kind of what's actually happening, but if it's, if it's gonna come down to, if people don't wear a mask in a narrow trail or a narrow park that we're otherwise allowing to be open, then we should enforce it and or we need to start communicating that this trail is gonna be closed unless people comply. I think that's sort of the, the, the stance I would take or that I would recommend. I, I, don't, I don't want park rangers to feel like they have to go around, you know, um, citing people or um, on the other hand, I think it is important if there are narrow pathways or, you know, back to what um, Dr. Chen Hong was saying about the, the setting, if there are really sort of settings we want people to be outdoors, but they can't actually physically distance well, then we probably should enforce wearing them in those settings. So uh, some of the, these questions are coming later, but in pushback to both of you, one of the um, issues that some park staff have is that they can't expect what is going to come up. Um, people might run up on them or so do they just wear their mask the whole day? And then the second issue is um, anything that they have to enforce is an interaction that they have to have with another human being. Like, so if they have to enforce mask wearing, that interaction is putting the park ranger at risk. Yeah. So um, how important it is, is it? Can they let it slide? Or I've always invited people to give masks. Um, to We talk about coming from a place of abundance that instead of thinking of enforcing something, maybe just have a lot of masks to give. Um, but I'd love your reaction to both of those issues. 
Um, I love the idea of having a mask to give, and I, I the other sort of challenge in this in this pandemic has been, um, you know, the fact that we have the shortage, so we really are continuing to recommend cloth masks for the public and for those settings. And so, but if if we could help make sure that the um, the parks are resourced to be able to hang out masks, I think that's perfect. Maybe we could even have a logo or <laughs> whichever park it is. Or um, so. so and, and to yeah. that note, I'd say yes, they should be wearing their own mask all the time. Um, all the time. Okay. And then um, I've heard reports of people throwing their masks on the ground. And so there's basically a trail of masks next to the trail. And um, my first thought is there should be clear trash cans. Um, but I think uh, park rangers are worried that those are all fomites. They're things that were on people's faces. So how, how can they deal with the fact that people are throwing their masks on the ground? I think I can respond first, and I'll have Dr. Pan uh, comment. For me, I think it's always a question of what's the most important thing. Like, I always tell my medical students, if you're stuck in a desert island and you had, like, two interventions to do, what will be that, those interventions? And they would be, like, keeping your nose and mouth away from somebody else's nose and mouth or wearing a mask if you can't. Um, and the second thing is washing your hands. So if you do those two things... It doesn't matter if they're full mites or whatever on masks, but I understand in a park setting, it may be challenging to always be able to wash your hands. In that setting, you know, if you can get hand sanitizer, et cetera, it may mitigate the risk. But again, if you have everything available and you can wash your hands, it doesn't matter what full mites are on different surfaces. Got it. So as long as it doesn't get from your hands to your mucosal yeah. mucosal. Your, you your hands are the muni that takes the virus from a surface to your nose or your mouth. Yeah, and I think Dr. Sue did a great job of explaining that too. Dr. Penn. Yeah, I would agree with that and just say, and I would think about, I mean, there's some other trash too that probably uh, they're picking up with other ways, either with gloves or some other mechanism. So, um, you know, if, if there is another way to pick it up, but I absolutely agree. I think the, ma the main thing is to be able to wash hands or hand sanitize after touching them and, and getting them into garbage. Okay, if, if there are runners or cyclists that come by you, should you be concerned that they're leaving a trail of droplets as we pass by them? Um, and this, this has actually been something that a lot of people are um, yeah. worried about. I can start with that and, and Eric can continue. Or Eric, if you want to go first, it's up to you. No, go ahead, go ahead. It's almost like we're on a TV game because like, <laughs> I, we just have to make sure we say the same thing, but I think we are on the same page. And I think it's great to get your perspective, which is more policy. And I'm coming more from like the biology and medicine part, but it has to live within a set of policy and guidelines. So I like actually this interchange that we have. So my idea about cyclists and runners, and I've been asked a lot of this, this, these kinds of questions by community members, is that it's all about risk. I'm sure you can look up data and hear data about people leaving a trail and a cloud of viruses running away from their mouth because you're exhaling more forcefully when you run or cycle. But the risk idea is an important one because it's still going to be much less risky if you're six feet away from that runner or cycler, unless you can't control your social distance and you're not wearing a mask, number one. Number two is the runner or cyclist, only going, cyclist is only going to be transiently next to you. So that absolute risk is not the same as if they were running around you in circles and exhaling, exhaling vigorously or cycling around you in circles and like breathing on you. So those are very different scenarios. So I'll have uh, Dr. Pan sort of give that thought from the policy perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And, and the other principle to think about when we're thinking about, for example, um, who is at highest risk of exposure from something from an infectious disease, we think about um, both proximity and duration, right? So. And to Dr. Den Hong's point and some of the slides you saw earlier, you know, yes, there's this theoretical risk, you know, further away that this virus is out there. But if it's transient like that, it's really unlikely. And, the, and I'll say really concretely what we use right now, and this is somewhat arbitrary as well, but to draw lines in the sand, we call a close contact as far as an exposure, somebody who's within six feet for more than 10 minutes. So this is extremely low risk. Um, I think it's you know, it's reasonable to be concerned. There's a theoretical risk that someone, you know, who is exhaling and, and, and that the particles could be expelled further than six feet, um, but it's a really, really low risk. 
So, so um, just to summarize, because I think maybe we haven't done that yet, and that's really important. It's face to face, less than six feet for 10 minutes is an exposure. And of course, the longer you're exposed, of course, in general, for all these infectious diseases, the household contact who you live with and who you're with all the time or an intimate partner are at highest risk for any disease, right? And everyone else is some, some smaller degree than that as far as the risk. So a transient sort of exposure to somebody is a really low risk. Um, and I think some of the studies I saw as I was uh, jumping on, you know, talked about even um, in some hospital settings or elsewhere where they've maybe seen the virus particle. It wasn't that that virus was actually able to then replicate and infect someone. So we have some really smart people watching this who are asking me about the inoculum size. How strong is it? One viri? <laughs> like I don't know the one virus, or is it like, or do you have to get a bunch of them on you? It's not funny, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I think these, it, it, these are all great questions, but I really think it was down to probability because even if the particle, so it's not like, I would say like crazy infectious stuff is like, you know, maybe Shigella or rotavirus or um, in the realm of respiratory viruses. What do you say, Erica, in terms of crazy infectious uh, are not being high? Measles, 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 of course, measles. measles. 12 to 18. It's not, not measles. it's not a measles. and um, so, meaning that in measles, to give you context, that patient comes in the room and leaves the room and you come into the room without the patient in there and you're going to get measles, potentially. So it's that r not or that infectious potential is just not there. And I think that r not incorporates a bunch of things like inoculum size, um, the, the transmissibility, etc. But with that said, there are a few cases of what we call super spreaders. And they, they probably involve other aspects that make one particular person just spread more than other people, other things being equal. So, but it's not, having... okay, but, but it's more that something about their biology, not that they're a virus. Well, yes. let's, I'm gonna pass some because the next section is very important. So the next group of questions is about helping people who work in parks define high touch surfaces. Um, things like bathrooms, um, yeah. trash cans, sand, flour. So I'm going to go through each one and I'm just going to show you the questions on bathrooms. Um, so I think I have it. Well, first of all, there's a question, does the CDC or local health officials have a best management practices recommendation for park staff cleaning restrooms and facilities? Maybe that's a good Erica uh, question first, okay, and then and I can get kind of response. Oh, sorry, Rinoshi. No, this is just what I found in terms of what the CDC says. But um, I would love to know local policy as well. I mean, it's it, there's no there's nothing different than this locally as far as restrooms, and this would be restrooms in any setting, right? Any public setting or places where people are. Um, and then just briefly, I will just say, you know, high touch is what it sounds like. Anything that's touched frequently by people, so doorknobs are one of the highest, right? Mm -hmm. Or anything someone is touching frequently. And, and just with, with everything else, I think all the sort of principles are the same. So the more something is touched, the more, the more people are touching it and the more it increases that probability or likelihood that maybe there's you know, a virus there. I think, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, we are absolutely making all these recommendations about cleaning and in medicine, I don't know if this came up earlier in the slides, we talk about, we call it fomite transmission. We don't know yet for this disease, um, what the contribution of that is versus, you know, really, again, the highest risk is close person-to-person -person contact. So we, we want to do all these other things to be really cautious um, and do our best to really minimize and slow spread. But, um, and it's hard to distinguish when someone's been infected from uh, a fomite versus close person-to-person. -person. But again, the highest risk is really that close person-to-person -person, um, contact. And so all of these other things are really helpful and important to minimize the the risk, but, um, and of course, the, the more something is touched, the more likely it has been in contact with either respiratory secretions or um, we do have concerns, you know, we know that this virus can be um, shed in the stool, um, but that you'd be worried about a whole bunch of uh, sort of infections from stool exposure anyway. So using the same principles about cleaning, um, you know, in restrooms or, or where you might be exposed to feces should, should apply. And what I that on that, oh, I keep cutting you off, Dr. Chin Go no. ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I love Erica's answer because it sort of like puts that soul high touch surface into context, which is like the one thing I would love this audience to get is exactly what she said, which is if you were stuck in a desert island and you had two things to do, it would be keeping your nose and mouth away from somebody else's nose and mouth. 
and the second thing would be hand washing. And if you do those two things, it doesn't matter about surfaces and high touch and all that stuff. So um, I, there's two things that I want to say about that. One of the park staff sent in a description that they don't really think people know the degree of what they deal with in terms of trash and feces and that they are basically the yard for every vulnerable yeah. population and that the degree of human waste that they deal with is different than I think we've been addressing on these webinars. Um, the other worry uh, that I heard some people express is that um, because the bathroom is the one enclosed space in the park, that the um, virus may actually be airborne in there and just walking in there might be of concern. Can you both um, address those worries? You want to start, Peter, or do you have a mark? I, I would I would caution folks to worry too much about the idea that it's airborne, because again, if you think about the model of probability or risk reduction, that's more, it's less anxiety provoking for me anyway to think of that rather than to think of all the places you could potentially catch the virus in the universe. So in terms of that, things being aerosol made an aerosol from a thing on the ground like waste, etc. I think that's relatively low probability. The things I think about are, as really high risk to making aerosol, meaning that you can give the droplets superpowers and make them smaller, like a hair, uh, kind of hairspray with a liquid inside, you make those droplets smaller. They're really in the hospital setting where we intubate patients with breathing tubes or we do bronchoscopy, where, because we like punch a bunch of air and oxygen with uh, a lot of fluid in the, patients um, airways. So that's a really high risk aerosol situation. And apart from that, particularly in the park setting, it's really lower risk. So that's the way I think of it. Um, you know, again, it's the way I approach it because otherwise I would feel kind of very nervous. Uh, it's every possible way I can get it. Although some of park staff are asking right now that they, do, they are trained in CPR and I'm, I'm sure there are some separate CPR guidelines that they're receiving. Yeah. Yeah. But CPR without intubation, if you're doing CPR with intubation, it's very different from CPR alone. Of course, the CPR part could be very risky if you're doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Right. Which I believe, I'm not an adult doctor, but I believe we don't, you guys don't do that anymore. But go ahead, Dr. Pan. Um, I, you know, again, I, I totally agree uh, with, with Dr. Chen Hong, and I think, um, you know, again, the idea of aerosolization is really from a human being. There's not anything I've seen or, you know, I think, again, it was, and everything is new with this virus, but um, aerosolization is about aerosolizing from a human. So just like uh, Dr. Chang was saying, like when somebody's being intubated or a procedure that's going to expel from someone's mouth or nose, like the, the droplets. But the feces part is, you know, it's not... I certainly haven't seen documented in this disease or prior SARS or MERS that it could be, um, you know, a windblown feces was then going to infect somebody. So it's really about, um, you know, then you're really more more worried about uh, fecal oral contact, which back to the, the main principles uh, that Dr. Chong is saying, you know, just if you're going to touch something else and you, you need to wash your hands before you touch your face or touch any mucous membrane. So it's really, really low risk um, as far as even if there's feces or waste in a setting that's being cleaned first, you should probably be using some sort of standard precautions for cleaning in that setting, regardless of COVID-19, um, that should protect you from COVID-19 as well. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of the bottom line. Great, and um, I do wanna bring us back to what Dr. Ramirez said, that just finding the virus in stool doesn't mean that it's alive or that it can infect anyone, which is basically Correct. what this CDC, um, and we have the link to the sites uh, where people can find this exact language. I love that example too, Nusheen, because people are going to be reading things in the media about finding virus in vents and on the floor of the pharmacy. There's no evidence that that virus, that RNA fragment is actually alive. So, and, and nor has it been linked to actual human cases of transmission. So okay. that's way, the way I'd like the audience to think about just putting all the information, which is a lot of information overload, I agree into perspective and thinking about it as risk. So just as a final word, well, actually one thing is frequency of restroom cleaning. A lot of people are worried about that and they're worried, is it actually more harmful to leave them open if they're not 
cleaned often? Um, or is it better to, you know, clean them less but leave them open? Uh, I will just say my general perspective is that I, I think it's better to leave them open and ideally still, you know, I don't know how often actually the baseline cleaning is, but um, I, I think it, in an ideal world you'd clean them a little bit more often than at baseline, but um, I do think there's potentially more harm in having them closed as far as people then not having a place to go and, and doing it sort of in a non-sanitary way. So, I think I've heard two every, people are doing it every two hours, but I... Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's great. That's a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. That's, yeah. that's really amazing that if you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just... So there are some questions, which I think I'm going to skip about how to clean surfaces uh, for other fomites, but I will point the the attendees towards really wonderful guidance from the CDC on exactly what to use to clean different surfaces. Um, but I do want to get to the question, so if it's okay with the panelists, I'm going to just show these and show that they actually have um, guidance for all the variety of, of um, uh, surfaces. And then move on to this one I already asked to show um, what people are really encountering. Um, this is a little bit about what kind of protection people who are doing the cleaning should wear. And one thing that the CDC said is that you don't have to hire any special type of people to clean. Um, but do you have anything to say about what kind of personal protective, people, protective equipment people should wear, not just when they're working out in the park, but actually when they're working with the bathrooms or stool? Yeah, or before, uh, Dr. Pan, I'd like to just give a framing comment around this because it came up, you know, in our lab, for example, when the <laughs> other members in this lab were worried that they'd get transmission of COVID from specimens we had from patients and test tubes. It's actually a very similar issue in terms of thinking about the transmissibility from other things. And it comes back to what Dr. Pan said, which is if that thing you're encountering is not a human, it's going to be very difficult to get disease from that might even if it's stool or seeming unclean. So that comes back to the idea of risk. And I think the things that the person would wear would be very similar to non-COVID, except that you would protect the mouth and nose of that person as well. But Dr. Pan, maybe you can amplify that from a policy perspective. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just sort of agree that um, uh, you, these recommendations that you're sort of showing that the CDC has make sense and it should be sort of uh, the basic kind of personal protective equipment and then in addition um, to be especially safe, I think, you know, covering the, and again, we're asking for universal face coverings in general, but certainly while cleaning makes sense just to, again, um, out of abundance of caution to make sure that nothing splashes in your nose or mouth when you are cleaning. But, uh, but beyond that, I don't think there's other special procedures. Thankfully, this is not, um, a virus that's really hard to remove with disinfection, like some of our other, like norovirus, for example, that people hear a lot about. Yeah, or C. Vitis, C. difficile, for example. Exactly, yeah. And then I, I have a series of questions about, like, are flowers fomites? Is sand so fomites? Um, and this is what I found from the CDC, but I don't know if you have any recommendations on what to do about outdoor surfaces that um, may be touched. And um, I guess they say that spraying disinfectant, well, they, this is actually about playgrounds. Um, what, what do you think about outdoor areas that may be touched? I mean, I, I can start off and maybe uh, Dr. Pan can <laughs> amplify as just from a, a biological and, and what I talk to community members about. Because there has been a lot of talk as we reopen the community about playgrounds and you know, it, it, it could be a little bit riskier, just not mainly because of the surfaces, because of the people in the playgrounds, which are like kids who like have this imprint that the playground is like a crazy place where you can like go and like run up to other people without um, any warning and also expose people in that way. But the surfaces of the playground, I think when I talk to people, it's like the stuff that COVID likes, which is hard and cold and metallic. So like the doorknob discussion that Dr. Pan talked about, there's a hierarchy of things that make some things higher risk than others. So cold, hard, metallic is worse than soft and porous and textured. So that's why 
a cool metallic railing is going to be worse than your clothing, for example. But that's the context. But again, it falls in the second layer after masking and washing hands. Got it. So human beings are the worst and then cold and hard. Yeah. yeah. And high touch, right? Um, <laughs> if there's some object on the ground that you don't really know if anybody has touched ever, that's really different than a handrail. A handrail is touched all the time. So you want to really focus on how often something is touched. Um, and so, and, and then the concern currently, you know, why we haven't opened playgrounds yet is, um, you know, that's kids' hands all over and we know uh, kids also are not, uh, you know, kids are wiping their nose, you know, it's, it's sort of um, definitely a high touch surface that um, at least it is easy to clean. So I think at some point we will get to that place where we will say, let's let them open, but clean them frequently. But right now it is still, um, you know, inherently a, a surface that is touched frequently and by, and by human beings that are less likely to have clean hands. <laughs> totally. And then you can control your environment in the playground because of the developmental stage of the other people in the playground. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I, well, I she flashed, knows that well. <laughs> I flashed by a slide that showed uh, um, quite really detailed guidelines on how to clean or disinfect an area by the CDC. I have a series of questions about um, being close to co-workers and do you need to be six feet away from co-workers for example people are working together um, where they have to get under things and they have to be near each other um, this is the one about like people coming up to um, yeah. rangers sometimes they have to put animals into cars so so what do you do in those situations i can start too from a general level and then i'll have dr pan if you don't mind give from a public health perspective or guidance. I'd say in the general level, it comes down to some of the other things we've discussed, which is like, if you can't control your environment, you wear the mask and then you have the other person ideally wear the mask too. That's why it's kind of nice if you can model that behavior from the beginning. So it becomes just normal and normalized rather than something you put on and off if possible. I know it's, it may get harder in the summer and it may be harder. But the other area that I think I've seen in communities where there are higher risk areas is when people get together in break rooms and they eat, because then you might be wearing your mask outside and you feel so relieved to like get that like exciting bowl of chili that you microwaved or whatever. It's you take your mask off and then you're next to that person three feet or less away. So I think that's the place where people should worry about a little bit just because of that setting it's very social we're used to having a good time but then you know those rules especially because you need your mouth to eat could be a little bit risky erica do you have thoughts yeah i think that's exactly right and again you know as we kind of slowly you know have to sort of resume things we are there's a couple concepts i think we're starting to um to kind of socialize people to be thinking about. So there's, you know, physical distancing as much as possible, right? And again, it's all level of risk. And if you have to come into closer contact, then ideally that's why you want everyone to universally mask. And so that's why we're, you know, recommending that now, again, when you're going to get your groceries and other things, because as Peter's saying, you can't control that environment. And I think the other thing, um, sort of moving forward, and this comes up a lot, you know, I was just on a different call with the schools about um, starting to think about slowly reopening Childcare and camps, and you know, we're going to start to, you know, as one of the things we're going to loosen. You know, right now everyone is in a what we're hoping to be a household bubble, right? A social bubble is really your household unit, and we're trying to really keep people as much as possible to only stay within that bubble. But slowly you're going to be, you know, we're letting kids now be in their like larger bubbles for childcare because again, our society can't function unless our kids are somewhere safe. And then as far as teams and working, you know, um, if you have work that you have to do that you have to be with close to each other and you can't physically distance, then you should be wearing your mask and where you're just in that, a smaller group. So trying to keep more consistent teams, um, you know, of the Rangers, for example, or- Cohorting. Um, trying to mix, yeah, cohorting, really trying to minimize mixing across different groups. And so that's the other kind of principle to start to think about. And, you know, again, we are gonna slowly but surely, you know, and we wanna do this as safely as possible as a community, um, but start to, you know, let people kind of start to interact so it's all again a, a spectrum of risk yeah and and i like that too because again it's always a risk benefit situation in general and i would say that um people are so in in need of that 
just even being six feet apart from somebody, but seeing them in a park situation would have such therapeutic benefits. Yeah, I know. That, well, that's next week. We're going to talk about the therapeutic benefits. I know that our time is up, but I'm wondering if I could bother you both for one more theme of questions. I know you have to go write it through. Just in general, if the density is super high in parks, how restrictive should they be in trying to reduce that? People are trying to block parking spots, but then that makes people park on the side of the street or in the community. Um, they are trying to make trails one directional, um, but that's hard. They're using lottery systems, but then the ranger actually has to check someone's ID, which is another interaction which is with a human being, yeah. which you just told us is the most dangerous thing. So the question I, and then some people are saying, why aren't you making people line up six feet apart to start the trail? and then walk six feet apart. And then the, the, you know, the really smart manager said, does that even make sense? Are we finding a solution to a non-existent problem? Should we just open the gate and tell people to stay apart and that's enough? Or do we need to be keeping them six feet apart? And I just love your thoughts on um, you know, practical strategies to reduce density in the parks because they are experiencing real surges. I mean, I think this will be, and I'll start a little bit too, but I think this will be great for Erica and you, Nusheen, because I think the strategies that schools are going to have to make when we go back to schools is probably very similar, which is like thinking about schools and shifts. So the idea of like imagining cutting your half, your half in population, your usual park size population might be a good place to start, meaning you want to start off with less density and then you work into these other potential uh, interventions. But I, I think the school situation is interesting too, because it's again, a large number of people that you usually have and how do you deal with it? Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is where, you know, clearly people already understand the principles about density. And that's where I think uh, people coming up with creative ideas and know their own sector, like we're really gonna try to mobilize at all different levels, local, regional and statewide different sectors to come together and kind of share their ideas and best practices and looking at what is out there. But I think, I think, you know, you all understand the principles. It's really about density. It's, it's sort of being said. And so, you know, it might be a little bit of trial and error. And, and so maybe it's, it's the parking spots, maybe it's um, lottery, maybe it's, you know, using the alphabet names or zip codes, you know, I think there's, there's, this is gonna to have to be, I think the, the experts are gonna be the people who operationalize these things and, and have, help each other, I think, figure it out. But I think, you know, having this kind of opportunity for us to make sure we're explaining the principles well is hopefully helpful. And then I think we definitely are gonna rely on each of you in the different sectors to kind of think about how to apply those principles. And we're happy to then hear other ideas on that. But I think as far as these different strategies, um, they all seem reasonable. And I think it's kind of getting to that point of like what works for that community and that sector um, and I think acknowledging that, you know, what's going to work in, you know, Piedmont, you know, in the East Bay versus, you know, Golden Gate Park versus some up in the foothills, you know, are all going to be a little different too. So, um, I, again, I think hopefully these have helped think about some of these principles and what the highest risk and lowest risk are. And then I think, yeah, when we'd want to rely on the community itself to really, or the administrators themselves of parks to kind of think through what, what, what you think you can do feasibly and operationally and what your community can accept or comply with. Mm -hmm. I think one other point just very quickly is it'll be great for park rangers to sort of notice just like you would for other behavioral issues, notice a little bit high risk situations. For example, a bunch of teens who are like all close together and they're not wearing masks, maybe trying to engage with them from a psycho psychological point of view about why they sh should not be doing that. And maybe, for example, I was in, the supermarket the other day and somebody wasn't didn't have a mask on and was kind of close to somebody else but instead of admonishing the person the way the grocery attendant did it was was brilliant i thought which is to say you know if you don't have a mask i can actually go back in the back and get you one and i think that sort of decompressed that situation so enforcement but with humanity yes and I think it's because we're in this for the long run and we don't want YouTube videos of people being dragged off of trails to go yeah. back. <laughs> it's a stressful time for everybody. So let's yeah try to come up with good ways to, to get buy-in rather than enforcement. Yeah. I want to thank both of you so much and Dr. Sood and Dr. Radhakrishna, I see that you're still here. 
Um, there were so many more questions and so there's clearly, what I take from that is that people working in the outdoors are very, very creative and also great problem solvers and they need a forum to show you all the things that they're doing. Um, and so um, hopefully we can write up what they're doing and next week we'll be talking not only about the role of parks in relieving toxic stress, but I hope also to share some of the strategies that are being used um, region-wide to, to comply with what I'm taking are basically the principles of reducing density and reducing um, high touch areas. Is that simple enough? Is and also prioritizing, I think, the nose and the mouth and the hand washing. Nose, mouth is where it comes in, and hand washing is how you, as Dr. Sood says, you crush the virus. All right, and I need to run. Thank actually. you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Bye. Bye.